Hey everybody, welcome back to Tim Travels. I'm your host, Terry, with uh, my sidekick, Beatrice. So, today is October 13th, 2013. 2013. <laughs> Where'd those 10 years go? Uh, 2023. October 13th, though. Somebody's birthday is today. Yeah, that's right. The United States Navy's birthday is today. So happy birthday to all the uh, swabbies, deck apes, snipes, grapes, frogmen, Airedales, Seabees. Who am I missing? Um, Twidgets. BB stackers, cannon cockers, skivvy wavers, and anybody that I forgot. So yeah, happy birthday to the United States Navy today. Um, so I and you know let let me say this right. I'm I'm very candid and and about a lot of things. And I think one of the ways you get better is you recognize your failings, you recognize your shortcomings, and you do things to overcome them. And I'm going to tell you right now that in the 20-ish years since I retired from the Navy, I've been sorely disappointed at the performance of Navy leadership um, on multiple occasions. And um, but, but I still have a a ton of confidence in the folks that are on the deck plates, the people that are in the hangar, you know, the people that are in the, on the boats and, and, you know, spec war, spec ops guys, everybody. I have, I still have a lot of confidence. Um, my cousin's in the Navy. Um, you know, my family has history with the Navy. So, um, you know, ho and hopefully, and 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 I will say this. You know, people think, um, <clears throat> people think I'm some flaming liberal, and I am about some things. But I really do think we we're just gonna have to dig deep, and we're gonna have to really ramp up funding for the U.S. military, but also for the Navy uh, in particular. Navy is asset intensive, um, and you know. I think part of the problem with recruiting in the military generally is that they're trying to do things, and like I talk about trucking companies, right? When you try to do things um, that you used to do, that used to work, but they no longer work, then you gotta shift gears. You gotta change course, you know? You gotta make adjustments, and you know, the military is not doing that. Um, I mean, I probably, I, I have, I actually, believe it or not, I have some ideas about what would help um, military recruiting. I also think, though, that retention is getting better, but, you know, we, we still don't take good care of the troops. And I'm not talking about the veterans, right? I'm talking about the troops. Like we still have problems with like military housing. And here's the thing, if you don't take care of, you know, it's it's one thing to take care of a sailor or soldier, marine airman. It's another thing to take care of their family. When the wife or the spouse is not happy, then, you know, it makes the service member's life unhappy. And I say the spouse cuz I my cousin is a retired senior master sergeant. Um, she retired, well, I was at Prime, so it's a couple years ago, she retired from the Air Force. And her husband, who had also been in the Air Force, he was the spouse, right? She was the career person. But, um, you know, it's, it's not okay to not take care of everything. And, you know, as a country, we don't have a lot of people that want to serve. So at least what we could do is, is, and I don't care if we raise taxes, right? We can't afford to let this slip any, any farther. Um, I saw an article just the other day about the part of the defense industry that builds submarines. We can't afford to not continue to produce stuff and keep that 
corporate knowledge going. Um, I had a I had a guy I went to high school with who worked um, on submarines as a civilian, and I'm I'm guessing he's probably retired. Um, he might still be doing it, but but um and and we were roommates for quite a while back in the 80s. But you know we need people like him too, right? Like he's my age, right? Actually, he's a little bit older, um, a few months older than me, and he's ready for retirement, right? Like we have to employ more people and, and, and it's a big deal. And I don't care what anybody says, the globe is still two thirds water. So the Navy has a huge, huge role to play. And, and like I, I've kind of alluded to before, if there's a war, um, especially in the Pacific, especially with the Chinese, it is going to be, um, it's going to be a big deal and it's going to be a, a huge naval war um, because that's just how it is that's how the globe is so um, speaking of the globe I'm here in um, what's this place called not <laughs> I wanted to say Ruth or Glenn but it's not that's over on 95 I'm on 81 at Tom's Brook <laughs> Duh. I'm at Tom's Brook I'm at the loves um, and I'm, so I'm here in the Appalachians, right? I'm in the Shenandoah Valley. And um, of course, Shenandoah is a river. The Appalachian Mountains are the mountains. So um, I've had people over the years who were from typically out west. And I even hear this crap from truck drivers. Oh, those mountains on the East Coast, they're little. And my response has always been, um, well, they're not little, they're diminished. And it's kind of like the equivalent of saying, well, that dude that's 25 years old, he's strong as shit, but that 70 year old guy's a weak. He's weak, he's little and weak. Well, that's kind of what it is with the mountains, right? The Appalachian Mountains are significantly older, like hundreds of millions of years older than like the Rockies or the Cascades. But here's another interesting fact about the uh, about the Appalachians. Did you know that the Appalachians go all the way, ge geologically, go all the way through the maritime provinces in Canada? Like Newfoundland is part of the Appalachian Mountains, okay? Um, so the Appalachian Mountains, and here's, here's another interesting fact, the Appalachian Mountains um, are actually located in, in the territory of three different countries. The United States, of course, and then I just told you Canada. But also there are a couple of islands that are like, um, that belong to the French in, in the, in the merit, up towards the maritime provinces. So actually France has some territory that is part of the Appalachian mountain chain. So, yeah, so these mountains, like the highest mountain in the Appalachians is Mount Mitchell. It's, a, it's down in North Kakalaki. It's about, um, it's a little over 6,600 feet. But here's the thing to think about. I've, I've climbed, and I say, I, I use that term loosely because it's really just like hiking uphill, steep uphill. But I've summited five uh, 14ers in Colorado. And I, I, I mean, I admit, it's been a few, it's, it's actually been 30 plus years, but it didn't seem that hard when I did it. Um, but um, here's the thing, right? Like those mountains that are like 14,000 feet, you know, people are like, oh, look at those. You know, and if you notice the Appalachians, there's no real pointy mountains and stuff. That's because they wore down. But here's the interesting thing about Mount Mitchell versus say Mount uh, Chavano, which I've climbed. Mount Chavano is 14,229 feet. It's down in uh, Chaffee County, Colorado. Mitchell is 6,600 feet. So, um, you know, about, what is that? About 7,600 feet lower. But here's the interesting thing. At the base of Chavano, you're probably at about like you, where you could drive up to with like a Jeep or we had a, when my friend and I went, we had like this old Scout. Uh, it was pretty cool. It was a four speed, you know, granny gear. Um, there's an old Scout that his father-in-law owned. And, but anyway, um, you know, we were probably 
we were north of 10,000 feet, I think. I think we were probably between 10 and 11,000 feet where we parked to then start summiting, right? So if you think about Mitchell, if you're at 2,000 feet, and you then, you know, in one of those valleys in North Carolina, you're at 2,000 feet above sea level and you hike 6,600 feet, right? That's the same as hiking up one of those 14,000 foot peaks. The only difference is the actual altitude. So what? So the hike is not gonna be harder um, in terms of energy but it is going to be harder in terms of the oxygen level. But that's, that's, the, that's the one big difference. But that just gives you an idea that the Appalachians were, and still, I mean, they still are a big deal. The other thing I tell truckers is I'm like, look, you can go down a mountain in Wyoming, man, and you could just coast at like 73 miles an hour for like five miles. That's not how it is in the Appalachians, man. You coast down a mountain in, in Pennsylvania for like a mile and a quarter, and then at the bottom there's like this hairpin turn, right? Or there's a river, you know, there's a bridge. Um, you know, so uh, if you're not from the East Coast and you haven't driven around the Appalachians, don't ever for a second think that it just because they're not as tall, they're not as dangerous to drive in. In fact, I find them more challenging to drive in. Um, and, you know, 81, man, I just do not like running 80. It's beautiful, it's beautiful, but there is so much traffic. And just today I got a message, there was a big shutdown south of, down south of Roanoke there. And, and I was down there just the other day, so anyway. So that's the that's our ge geology lesson for today and geography too I guess. So I wanted to talk about something you know I'm often very strident and I recognize that I um, when I get amped up about something I typically don't I'm kind of like a pit bull um, once I get my teeth in something I don't want to let it go and um, and I don't want to I don't want to lose the argument. Um, and I think that people that um, deal with me, like at you know my company or whatever, they kind of probably know that. And I'm not saying whether it's a great attribute or not, um, but I'm not afraid to you know speak truth to power. And I never have been. I never have been. Not in the military not as a lawyer. I mean, I, I freaking kept my mouth shut a lot of times when I really wanted to lash out at a judge because, you know, I didn't want to end up in handcuffs. But, you know, um, but I will tell you that, um, you know, I, I, feel like, I, I feel like I'm a happier person when I just don't let uh, injustice or unethical behavior or just things that could be better not try to get fixed. So, but, but the other part of me, I, I, I've always been lucky that I've had friends who were like, and I, I don't want to say I'm unreasonable, but, but I would call them the voice of reason. And it, it's often, it, it often is beneficial in life to have people around you that are not like you, right? And I think that's part of the problem, just generally speaking in the United States, we have a lot of people who are only ever around people that are just like them. And that, you know, in a country this big with this many different kinds of people, that's really not a formula for having a country that wants to work together, you know? Um, but, but, you know, it's like my, my wife, my wife one time we had a, my wife worked for my law firm and we had a meeting with a client and my partner was there, I was there, my wife was there because it was something that my wife worked, a uh, system that my wife worked on. Um, and, you know, the client had concerns and my partner did all the talking, right? And he was just so, like, they came into the meeting like, oh, we're going to beat these guys up. And by the time they left, it was almost like they were apologizing to us, right? Because my partner was just so smooth. 
And, you know, but there are other times when I, my approach worked. So last night I had something going on. It was, it was crazy, right? So I had waited after I dropped my last load down by Roanoke. I waited, I, I waited basically about 27 hours to get both the next dispatch and to get the load and be able to pick it up. So my pickup, because my, my delivery the other day was at 1700 and my delivery, my pickup yesterday was at 1700. Um, so, and, and I know that's only 24 hours, except that I was at the other receiver early and I, you know. So anyway, I go there, I show up about like 1638, 1640, somewhere around there. I go in, um, and this is at US Cold Storage in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I go in and uh, nice, nice lady there in the office. Um, and you know, I always find US cold storage folks to be quite professional and play, the places are always like neat and tidy. They have clean bathrooms for the truck drivers to use that are actually inside of a building. You know, they're nice, they're nice facilities. Um, you know, the parking lots are never tore up or anything. And, but this facility is, probably one of the older facilities that I've been to of theirs, but it was still neat and tidy. It was just older. So I go in and, and, you know, ladies like, you know, I fill out the paperwork, give her all my info. And then she's like, Hey, go to door 23. She goes, set your reefer at minus 10 and back in, you know, slide your tandems back in with the doors closed, which is very standard practice at a U.S. cold storage. And so when I got there, there were four other trucks there. So, but my load had to be delivered at 2300 last night up between DC and Baltimore up in Jessup. So many of you will know where Jessup is. Um, so I'm like, okay, you know, this is a little tight, but you know, it's, it's definitely doable. I said, as long, you know, as long as I'm out of here by about in about three hours, I should be just fine. If I'm out of here by 20 hundred, I should have enough time to get up there. Traffic will be died down in the DC area, Northern Virginia. I get up there, right? So then, you know, I realize no one's even like, like everybody is still just sitting there after I've been there like two hours. And so I'm like, man, I'm gonna go tell them that, you know, I got a delivery tonight. And I go in and I say, hey, and first I actually stop, there's two other prime trucks there, but I stop and talk to a guy from Garrison Trucking. I said, hey man, how long you been here? He's like, four hours. I said, I said, oh. <laughs> he's like, I said, yeah, I'm supposed to deliver at 11 o'clock tonight up in, up in Maryland. And he's like, you, you ain't gonna make it, man. And he goes, cause, my appointment was at two, which was three hours before mine. So I still go inside and I'm like, hey, you know, I, I wasn't like upset or anything. I'm like, hey, um, do you know what's going on? I'm in door 23. She's like, oh, we're running really behind. I'm like, okay. And so I sent a message to Prime. And one of the things I said in the message was, please let me know whether I'm going to be able to deliver this tonight if I can't get there by the appointment time. Because a lot of times if you can't make it by the appointment time, they just make you come the next day or whatever. And what I didn't want to do is like drive like a maniac, you know, up to, up to Maryland and then find out that I couldn't deliver anyway. Because then I'd have had to find a place to park or else I'd had to go like to my town where I live parked there I would I would have gone home but um, it would have been a huge hassle because I got B with me I, you know it would have been a huge hassle because I couldn't have just bobtailed home obviously I'd have the trailer on my back so I'm like all right I'm just gonna wait I'm gonna keep prime apprised of what's going on so I don't hear anything back from prime 
which is not unusual that night dispatch doesn't answer messages for out at all at all and this this same guy that was there last night was the guy that was there when i had to take a huge detour in west virginia a couple of weeks ago didn't answer my messages and you know i finally call i finally pull off the road and call and i'm like dude are you going to answer tell me what you want me to do right because i can't get this delivered on time so last night so then i said i sent another message and i'm like hey could you answer my previous question which was am i going to be able to deliver if i'm late you know because maybe if i show up by 4 a.m they'll let me deliver he sends a message back finally and he's like yeah i don't have a pre-plan for you i'm like and this guy is the most lazy piece of dirt I think at prime, right? Like this guy, and there are people that will know who I'm talking about. Like he, he is complained about a lot. And I, I know that from talking to my fleet manager and I don't even know how this guy has a job because he is botched just with me. He has botched some really big things. Like he botched a FedEx load one time. Um, that my part my teammate and I couldn't we couldn't pick up because we had a tr our trailer was down and I told him and then he was like oh it's a it's okay it's a drop and hook but then he didn't do anything I was like all right bro he didn't do anything he didn't get another team on it and then it didn't get picked up and my fleet manager was freaking the next morning I was like you gonna fire this guy he's like oh I don't know I don't know they didn't but anyway so hours hours go by and then finally all of the other four trucks that were there the two primes and two others they finally have left i get a knock on the door right and by this time i was like all right i'm just going to sleep get a knock on the door i roll my window down and this dude's like hey man uh you here to get loaded or unloaded what are we doing and i was like you don't even know? I said, loaded. He's like, oh, all right, uh, can you open your doors for us? You can pull up and open your doors? I'm like, oh, okay. Which was unusual, right? Because that's not usually how they do it at US Cold Storage. So I pull up and I already have my tandem slid and everything like the lady told me. And then this guy's like, well, I'm sorry. I didn't know I'm new here, you know? And I'm like, okay. And then he's like, so you're gonna slide your tandems? I'm like they are slid oh I thought they were supposed to be up I said I can put them up but usually people want them all the way back if they're gonna you know I said if you don't mind bouncing around no no we we'll just leave them and so and then it took them another because I was the only truck there it took these guys another hour and a half to two <clears throat> to two hours to put 20 pallets in my truck so by the time I got out of there I had been in the sleeper berth over 10 hours and I still didn't have an answer to whether or not I could deliver because by this time it's like it's like 3 30 in the morning right so then I get on the phone on my live loaded call this guy finally picks up the phone and I'm like so can I deliver this? Like, did you, you never answered my question. Oh, well, send me an ETA. So I sent him an ETA, but there's what I did on the ETA. I said, here's my ETA. But I said, every minute, because, and, and I'm totally serious about this. I try to be precise, right? I said, every minute that, that you delay telling me, or sales delays telling me that I can whether or not I can deliver, that's gonna add 90 seconds to my estimated time of arrival because now at 4 a.m. leaving the middle central part of Appalachian or of the Shenandoah Valley, it's already gonna be rush hour by the time I get up to, you know, Northern, get Northern Virginia and East, so towards DC. It's already gonna be rush hour because rush hour starts around 4 30 in the morning right and and even if i took a more circuitous route to get around the capital beltway it's still going to be rush hour getting like from the frederick area over to i-95 to go south 
you know, so I'm like, every minute that passes, add 90 seconds. So I don't hear anything back. And I didn't think, cause all he was like, I messaged sales. And so, I, but I just had the laugh, right? Like it was so like, it, it went from, you know, ridiculous to sublime, right? It went from a delay. And then I got to a point where I was like, I am not getting this delivered on time. I, you know, it was like this sense of relief, right? Because if they got me loaded at like 8.15, I'd have been like, all right, well, I might be able to make it. And I would have been hurrying. And, you know, that's when you make mistakes, right? So I was really grateful that they just took forever. Even though if I'd have gotten it delivered last night, I'd have been home. But sometimes, you know, and so getting back to what I was saying about people that, um, people that keep me from going off the deep end sometimes, I was thinking in my head, you know, if Lyle was here, he'd be relishing this enormous delay because he he's all about the detention life. And so interestingly, you know, I get some messages. I was asleep at this point, you know, eight o'clock this morning. And, you know, my fleet manager's like, all right, well, we're gonna get detention and layover, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, all right. So I didn't have a great week last week. I think I only netted around 1300 bucks today. And I would have preferred that that be at least twice that much, but really more like three times that much. Um, but I only had two trips and I, and truthfully I did sit around a lot and I didn't want to, but I did. And that's trucking sometimes, right? But here's the thing. I needed 1300 for seven days work essentially. That's a rich people problem. And I'm not saying I'm rich, but there's a lot of people in the United States that work a whole month and that's all they net. There are. And, or that's one of their jobs. And so even though I didn't have a great week and this coming week won't be particularly good because I'm gonna start home time, hopefully late tonight, early in the morning because my load now delivers at 21.30. You know, I might get home around midnight um, cause I'm going to have to ditch this trailer somewhere and, and go home. But, you know, even though it's, um, it's not what I had hoped for last week and it, it you know, it'll be a little short this week, certainly cause I'm taking home time. You know, I, I don't have a lot of problems and I think sometimes, you know, I, and what I realized over the past week is some days I am really, really really unhappy with any number of things. My truck, my schedule, uh, the people that I have to deal with at, at, at my company, um, trucking in general, other truckers. Other truckers, I mean, they on, on the daily, another trucker will piss me off. Sometimes it's just because they're, well, sometimes I have to laugh though. Cause I pulled into a loves further South, uh, yesterday and there was a truck broke down right at the intersection and they had put their triangles out. But what cracked me up about this broken down truck, and I don't know, they might've run out of fuel, but, um, what cracked me up is when I went by it, you know, usually when there's a truck broken down and they got their triangles out, you see a driver maybe sitting there waiting for somebody to come. They had their curtains completely drawn, like, we're not even home. We're not, you know, and it was in the way. It was not because they had turned the corner. And so they were part of the way around the corner. And the reason I say they might have run out of fuel because it was kind of one of those fly by night companies. And I saw these two dudes carrying five gallon jugs of fuel down I-78 recently. Their truck was about a mile beyond the exit and they're walking down the on-ramp from the loves there in Charlottesville. So I don't know what happened, but um, it wasn't me, so I was happy. But it, I did just think it was funny that they had their curtains drawn. Like they're like, F it, we're broke down. I'm going to sleep. Now, I will say, I, I'm gonna finish with this thought. You know, yesterday I talked about companies that said, if anything's amiss, you need to get out 
right? Well, when I got, when I broke down back in January, you know, Prime had, and Prime's good about this. Prime had, you know, a um, couple of tow trucks or a couple of trucks there within a couple hours to both take my trailer and to tow me and into Wichita. And, you know, so I had a chance to talk with the tow driver. He, he and I had some things in common. We both like cycling and stuff. And he was a super cool guy. He brought my bike for me um, to the hotel for me. Um, so he, he, he dropped the truck at the Freightliner dealership and took me to my hotel. But one of the things he was telling me is a lot of times these trucks break down from these fly-by-night companies and um, they, won't, they won't pay what the going rate is to get the truck towed somewhere. And so there will be people literally living in their truck on the side of the road, broken down. And he said, these companies, these sketch ass companies, they'll call like a couple of times a day trying to negotiate a better rate. They're like, oh, well, how about, could you do it today for this much money? Like they're hoping to catch these guys when it, they're, you know, they're short of business or something. Like they won't pay the going rate to get one of their trucks off the road and get their drivers off the road. So anyway, you know, there's a lot to be, you know, the mega carriers have a lot of problems, but my experience with the mega carriers, like when I was at night and here at Prime, is that um, when a truck is broken down on the side of the road, they get something done about it right away. Um, you know, so anyway, and, and heck, when I was at night, you know, if your truck was broken down, like if you were at a terminal, a lot of times they would, um, like one, when my first truck broke down, they put me up in a hotel, um, you know? So anyway, I just share that with you. It's another little thing that I thought of about how to tell if you're with a crap company, if they're like, yeah, well, there's nobody to, there's nobody to come help you. Well, that's all, that's never true. It might take a couple hours, but it shouldn't take 24 hours to get like a tow. So anyway, uh, enjoy your weekend. Be safe. It's going to be uh, heavy, heavy rain over like the eastern third of the country. So be careful out there, especially in areas where it's been a drought, like the northern prairie. You know, like the, the upper Midwest, a lot of places have been in drought. So if it starts pouring down rain, you know, everything that's on the road is going to get um, entrained in water. Oh, there you go. There's your word of the day, entrained. Talk to you guys later. Bye.